Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? You can reply in the chat box. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you can also see me, right? Well, okay. Fantastic. Uh, so, welcome to this uh, Dizal webinar together with Troika. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Leticia Moraes. I'm a senior consultant at Troika and I've been working uh, in the ELT uh, for almost 20 years already. Uh, and I'm also events coordinator at the uh, special interest group for young learners and teenagers from IATAFO. Um, ah, it's nice to see that you have people from different places. So, Goiás, Rio. Um, I'm Belém, Teresópolis, Salvador, Belo Horizonte, Resende, Guarulhos, Curitiba, Ottawa, wow. All right, so um, uh, during this webinar, I want to talk to you a little bit and I want you to reply to me as well. So throughout the webinar, I'll be asking you some questions and I really encourage you to reply uh, to my questions in the chat box so uh, that this can be really more interactive, not only me talking, talking, talking all the time, all right? So I'm here uh, to talk to you today about uh, student-centeredness, of having students uh, in the center of instructions, right? Uh, and I want to start with the question, what that is, okay? So uh, how would you define that? How would you say, what, how would you define this idea of student-centeredness, of having students in the center of, of instruction, of student protagonism. So Alan Soto mentioned uh, needs analysis. Definitely, it's important for that. Students needs, let's see, lots of people typing, considering students needs. The teacher is a mediator, not a provider, right, Rodrigo? Um, the information is everywhere and available. Less TTT. We take their contacts into uh, account. Students taking responsibility for their own learning. Yeah, so it's a little bit of all of these, right? And then... Uh, we can put that in very different ways. So I want to show you some of the things uh, student-centeredness and having students as the protagonist is not, right? So this is not about the subject being taught. So the focus shifts from what you're teaching to the learner. So there is this shift. So it's not subject-centered, is student-centered. It's not about letting students decide everything. I have already heard that, but if something like, if you are delivering a student-centered lesson, if students are the protagonists, does it mean that they will decide everything? Uh, not necessarily, right? Um, exactly, here, Selina mentions that he comes to conclusions, yes and their conclusions are taken into account. They are taken on board, right? So we are not only triggering their reflection, but their reflection is also uh, acknowledged, embraced uh, during the lesson, right? So uh, to keep that in mind, it's uh, to, to go to the learner as the center of instructions, we have to, be, to have it very clear that it's not anything goes, and it's not the students who decide everything, and it's not them letting necessarily them decide to do everything. Uh, so, uh, and it's not only dogme as well. So, dogme definitely is very student centered, but it's not necessary, it doesn't have to be dogme, right? 
And so to systematize that a little bit more, uh, what it involves, right? This is according to lots of different people that you have there at uh, the bottom of the slide, right? You have Anna Penido, Dave Little, Lenny Dam, Leinhardt, uh, Jack Richards, John Hattie, um, Vicky Vinton, you have lots of them. Uh, so this is a compilation of different people who talk about that, right? So first thing it involves is having students in the center of the learning process, as I've mentioned before. So it's not this subject. So when you plan your lesson, you have to think first on the, 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 the learner, then at the subject. So, and the decision of what is going to be taught will also depend on the learner. That's why they are the center, and that's why that's how we, we start with that layer. Okay, um, some people are asking about the slides. Uh, I can share with you my email later on, and then if you want, I can share you via email. So don't worry about that, all right? Um, so uh, students as the protagonist also involves seeing learners as the agents of their own learner, of their own learning. So as you've mentioned before, uh, students have to take uh, responsibility for their learning as well. It's not only on uh, the learner. It is, it's not only on the teacher. So it's this shift be between what I teach and uh, we are more focused on what it's going to be learned, what learners will, will learn, right? Um, so uh, someone mentioned before the discovery. So it's, this is something really, really important when you talk about protagonism. So the learners will have the opportunity to discover things and to explore things. So uh, instead of providing, they will be discovering. So we'll provide them not with the language and not with the content, but with the means and the right questions for them to discover and explore what they're going to, to what they're learning, what they are studying. Right, so um, it also aims at allowing learners to choose their own learning path, so giving them choice. It's not about letting them choose everything, but they have some choice there for them to, to decide their learning path, how they're going to do things, right? And finally, uh, it's seeing the learning process as a narrative, right? Um, then here, I usually like to make an analogy with RPG, role-playing game. Um, has anyone here ever played RPG? No? Yes, yes. Yes, some gamers around, but not everybody. All right, so um, when we play RPG, uh, and then when I'm talking about RPG here, I'm not focusing on a video game RPG, not electronic RPG, thinking about table RPG. So you sit there around a table, you have the players and you have the, the master, right? The master is the one who is guiding uh, the process, right? So it's guiding the narrative. Role-playing game is a very narrative kind of game. So uh, the, the narrative of the game is constructed with the the players but it doesn't mean that the master doesn't prepare anything uh, there is huge preparation before any session or any campaign of rpg the master has all the resources possible so they have to plan uh possible ways they try to anticipate possible attitudes the players will make they will plan the setting uh, in the case of the narrative, the conflict, because without a conflict or without a quest, uh, nothing much will happen. So they set a quest, uh, they set the, the setting, and then they try to predict how things are going to develop. But the way things actually happen will depend on the players. And it's the same thing in the classroom. The teacher will prepare the thing, so the text that's going to be worked on, the material that's going to be used, 
the kind of questions that they they, they take try to we try to anticipate the kind of questions learners are going to ask and if they ask these questions what could be the the consequences how can you go from there and then we try to anticipate everything and plan but sometimes not everything happens according to what we plan and then um we have to uh, we cannot ignore the what the learner is giving us or if you're talking about rpg what the player is giving us because if they decide to go to a, a different way that you hadn't anticipated you cannot simply say don't go you cannot go that way you have to play along and many times when the unexpected happens in the classroom we have we cannot say you cannot ask me that now do you know that question that learners ask and that's not quite what you had planned uh if you simply say don't do it and don't ask this question now we're going to talk about this later how, how you're actually not thinking about the learner for some reason uh that particular learner thought this question was relevant at that point so we cannot simply disregard the question uh we we need to address that but the way we are going to address that um is different uh cannot uh, can be different depending on your plan so if it's it's something that you know that's going to be dealt with in a moment you can even say ah we're going to talk about that in a moment uh just uh hang, hanging there let's just finish this up then i'll address your question or something like that if it's something totally different or maybe what happens sometimes is that something very very complex that especially for basic levels uh could be overwhelming uh then you cannot uh maybe if you address everything in details it's, it's not going to help learner learners but you can give them a hint ah, okay this is uh about uh how we express experiences uh this is a bit different we can use this in this context and not that one and but don't worry we'll study that in due time i don't know right uh as alan said <laughs> dealing with the unexpected is all about class management but it's more than that right class management is really really important but it's also about uh taking a step back so thinking that uh it, it doesn't depend everything on you so uh it's an exercise of letting go of your own ego sometimes right um let me just see the comments ignoring students is a faux pas i agree but it happens more often than not Alan. and sometimes it happens without us even noticing that because you know in the classroom there are 10,000 million things going on and sometimes it can just slip through our fingers a beautiful opportunity can just go away um so it means there's room for negotiation on, uh, of how the class is conducted i'd say so right so if you truly want the student to be the protagonist of your lesson this room for uh negotiation is important right um especially in the beginning yes Celine, you can answer the questions shortly without giving much details addressing their needs but as the teacher we know uh how how much we can cover from that so in how much detail we can uh go into at that moment thinking about the learner who asked and the rest of the group as well if you're working in a group right um yes lusa made an in interesting point here too that especially at the beginning it takes time to know the students it definitely does and the more we learn we know learners the better we can plan the lesson so in the beginning the unexpected will happen more frequently right all right uh any questions about what that is what being 
having students as the protagonist of the lesson as the, uh, the student in the spotlight means. How can we motivate learners on this process? Yeah, um, we are going to talk about that right now, and it has to do with why. Okay, Rodrigo. So, why should we go for uh, this process? Because sometimes uh, learners they, they feel uh, when you want them to be responsible for their own learner, they they, they sometimes they even feel that I'm not ready for that or something like that. So. Why should we insist on that, insist on giving them more uh, responsibility? Lucia also had an important, interesting point here. Is it possible to follow a textbook and still have student as a protagonist? Yes. We'll cover that in more details later on, but it, we, it's definitely possible because it has to do with active listening and reacting genuinely to what they bring to you so it is possible so let's see ethic learning plays a big role definitely it engages students um any more reasons selena what do you think it's the best way i, I tend to agree with you but let us try to explain a little bit uh, Paulo, I'll leave my email, don't worry. If I forget by the end, remind me. Uh, learn better taking responsibilities. It's more motivating. They became active. Let's see. Bruno says that it's quite enriching when you let them participate in the decision-making process. They bring a lot of previous experience to the class especially in terms of technology use. Yes, this is an interesting point because the teachers doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to be the know-it-all. So especially when it comes to technology and you're dealing with teens, many times they will know much more than us. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we can take advantage of this knowledge. So it's a, a, a a very interesting path to engage learners and for us to also learn a little bit more about technology or about something that we actually don't know, right? So uh, let's see what Richard has to say about that, right? Um, so when we have students in the center of instruction, usually the, they will, uh, the interaction will be more frequent and the participation as well. So the quantity of learners' participation and interaction will increase. And this is, it. this is what we want. We want them to speak more than we do, right? Remember that in the beginning, someone mentioned the TTT, right? Uh, so we lower the TTT, we give them more opportunities for them to participate and interact. So we focus on the teacher talking time, on something more quality talking time. And it doesn't mean that the teacher is not going to speak, but the quality is going to be higher because we're going to speak less, right? Um, and it contributes for the learning experience to be more meaningful. So, and why more meaningful? Because if you are thinking about learners' needs and preferences, probably it's going to fit much better in what the learners need. And even if we work with a book, uh, we can address their needs and preferences. So if they need to work more on listening, but reading is all right, we can spend more time working with listening, for example, and uh, cover the reading part more quickly. This is just an example, right? So if they want to, if they need to know uh, for example, if you have a group where you have learners who are taking pr those proficiency tests for masters or doctors, and they have to actually work with reading and text comprehension, you can focus more on techniques, strategies for that. Uh, so it becomes more meaningful, even when you work with materials that's, that 
are ready made there for you, right? It depends on how you deal with them, how much time you will work on that, right? Um, okay, I hope Teresa that you could can hear you hear us now. And Paulo mentions let students speak the mind. Yeah, definitely. This is important, and this also helps to develop uh, the so-called 21st century skills. I don't like the term very much, but they, the skills themselves, they're really, really important, uh, and they need to be developed. And when students have more opportunities to participate and interact, we have more room to develop these skills as well. It goes beyond only the language, right? And when uh, students have more space to contribute and they are in the center, the connection uh, with uh, learners' life experience gets easier and um, you can uh, address better. So they can bring their life stories. Sometimes uh, we like telling, sh sharing our own stories and students love that. But they also have lots to share and lots, ex lots of experience and things to share. So this is an opportunity. And then, as I mentioned before, you are responding to their needs and also their difficulties. So if it's something that you notice that uh, by the end of the lesson, they weren't better able to perform, blah, you can go back to that topic later on on the following lesson, for example, right? But if you look at this, all of these will reflect in engagement, right? So all of these contribute to students getting more engaged and therefore more motivated. So having them in the center of instruction, although some of them may uh, feel a bit insecure at first because it's also responsibility for them, uh, it contributes in the end to their engagement and because it contributes to the engagement it contributes to their learning all right so any questions so far my technology came from my students contribution yes they definitely feel great when they are part of it it's really motivating so far, so good. No, okay. So we've covered what that is and uh, why do, doing that, right? So something that we always want to know, it's the how. Some questions have already, already emerged. I have already mentioned one or two things about that. But the how is very, very important, right? And I wanted to know if you have any, any house to share as well before I, I go on. Let's see, there's some people typing. No, we're studying as, as much as possible, right, Lari? Definitely. TTG is something I really need to work on. Yes, but... Juliana, you don't have to see TTT as something bad because sometimes TTT can be quality teaching time. So uh, think about that as well. And in a one-to-one -one environment, that's really a bigger challenge. Um, yes, Selena, this is a very common way of doing that. Any suggestions? But open questions like that will many times resulting something like that or ah, no not really it's uh some depending on the group and depending on the learners it can be hard to get their contributions so getting more focused questions help so instead of asking any suggestions it can be more effective if you ask how would you do this how have you ever Faced that how did you deal with that so it can help it's basically the same thing but it's not a yes or no question that they can simply go and say yeah. if, when you're thinking about teenagers is yeah. very common response right um 
And because they are speaking in English as well, sometimes they don't have the language. And when you have more specific questions, they may feel more uh, motivated and secure, and then you can guide them a little better. Yes, asking them is always good, but have to work on the, the right questions, right? Um, in warm-up activities, ask them questions about their life. It's also, it's interesting. Giving choice is interesting as well. So all of this happens, right? Um, when we think about student-centeredness, sometimes we start to, we go straight to uh, methods and strategies and techniques that can be more favorable to student-centeredness and to students as a protagonist. Um, and then what comes to us is uh, things like project work, project-based learning, task-based learning, maker space, maker learning, gamification, all of these would emerge. And these are definitely more favored appro approaches and resources and strategies and everything to have students in the center of, of instruction. So having them uh, work, working with this can help. But as I forgot who asked that before, someone asked uh, about the course book. It's not because you're using a course book that you're not going to be student-centered. These approaches, they are more favorable. But if you don't have, uh, if you don't want to be student-centered or if you're too attached to old ways of doing things, um, of this image of the teacher in the front and the learners over there, then uh, even project work can be teacher-centered. So uh, I'll give you even PBL per se can be student uh, teacher-centered. Let me give you an example. So if you have a project and then you tell them, okay, so you're going to make a poster about hearing impairment to be, um, to be exhibit, exhibited at school. And you have to mention what students can do, what they can do. And you have to use this, 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 and that idea. And then you're guiding them that much. Depending on how much you guide, this is not going to be student-centered. So if they don't have any opportunity for choice, as you've mentioned before, this is not having the students in the, in the spotlight, in the center of instruction, right? So uh, even approaches, resources, strategies, techniques that are potentially student-centered, they may end up being teacher-centered depending on how we deal with them, right? So what I always say is that have putting the learner in the center, it's more about a shift, a shift of attitude and a shift of mindset. Because even with uh, a very strict course book to follow, you can address their needs. Of course, if you're teaching a PPP lesson, the way you address students' needs and uh, their questions and everything may be different from a PBL lesson a test-based lesson, but uh, it, it's more about the attitude and the mindset. If you have the mindset for the learner, it's much better than just changing the method. So it's, a, it's just this shift, which can be really liberating for us teachers. That we don't have to change because sometimes we are teaching in a context where things are very uh, framed. So we have to follow certain guides and you cannot uh, do anything different. So you cannot bring a project for, for learners to show all their creativity and knowledge. Sometimes we don't have this option right so um if we think that it's more about the mindset and the attitude than the approach or method then it means that any of us can 
look at learners in a more um, in a more having them as a more important playing a more important role in the the stage that's the classroom, right? Uh, Maria Socorro mentioned that it depends a lot on the profile of the group as a whole. Definitely, it does. And knowing the profile is already putting the learner towards the center of instruction, right? Um, and when Alessandra asked, what do I mean by changing the mindset, right? It means that uh, you have to sometimes forget our plan. We are going to plan everything. We are going to have everything uh, planned for the lesson, like the master in the RPG game. But sometimes uh, we have to, to think that, OK, I planned all of that, but I'm, I cannot teach that right now. I'll have to change my plan because of something that emerged in the classroom. Maybe it's not the whole plan. Maybe it's an activity. Maybe you notice that the target language you worked, you were working with is too easy for them. Everybody knows that already. So why insist on doing that, on doing very controlled practice um, activities and not going to something freer? So it, it has to do with that. It's how you see things, right? And with this, how we change attitude, how should be this uh, student-centered attitude and mindset, it has to do with uh, being a student-centered teacher. This is a concept that Hattie uh, brought up, right? The concept of uh, a student-centered teacher. Have you ever heard of that? Because you usually say student-centered lesson, but have you ever learned, heard of student-centered teacher? Yeah. So let's see what he means by that, right? Most of you, I guess all of you have never heard of that. All right. So what he, he mentions, uh, what, what he explains about that. So he, he says that a student-centered teacher has these four uh, characteristics. Warmth, empathy, trust, and positive relationships. So the student-centered um, teacher they accept, there's affection, respect uh, towards the learner. So um, it, has, it, it's, it has warmth towards the learner, right? So you don't have this distance, right? Um, in terms of trust, it means that the students, the student, the teacher is able to establish a relationship of trust with learners. So uh students notice that the teacher believes in them even though sometimes students are aware that they have difficulties that they are struggling that the topic you're working on is hard but if the students feels that the teacher trusts that they can learn they will feel more empowered to keep on trying because sometimes I don't know if you, as a learner you have ever felt like that, but if, uh, if the student feels that the teacher thinks that they will never learn, it's much more easier uh, for them to give up, right? So this is something really, really important, right? And also for the teacher to develop this empathy, not to forget how it was to be a learner, to have... Uh, this feeling of being in the shoes of learners. So sometimes as a language teacher, it's very important to be a language learner, learner yourself. So if you are learning a different language, sometimes you look and say, oh my God, that's really hard. And I don't understand why, why my students struggle. Because as we master the language, sometimes we forget. And it's not because... Uh, of anything, it's just because we forget. It's been sometimes it's been a while. Sometimes we learned in a different way. Sometimes uh, we have a different contact with the language. So students have different backgrounds. So uh, for us to understand these needs and difficulties is very important as well. Uh, and 
one strategy of doing that is being a learner yourself. Um, I've been doing that. I've been learning French nowadays. And I'd say that now I'm getting towards B1. So it's better now. But I'd say that everybody told me in the beginning, no, it's going to be easy. French, ah, you already speak, you, you already speak English and German. Ah, French is going to be fine. And then when you get to the numbers, to the verbs, to the then you say, ah, it's not that easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so they have said, okay, each language has its challenge. Of course, it's not going to be the same one, but then we feel and it's easier for us to develop this empathy, right? And the idea of uh, positive relationships, right? So, um, so when you have warmth, empathy, and trust, we are building a positive relationship with, with our learners. And then we are going to uh, have them more naturally in the center of instruction, even if you're following a very strict and framed method, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so Roger is saying that numbers in French is more math than anything else. I totally agree. <laughs> I can see that you have all the language learners. That's wonderful, right? Uh, Selena is talking about uh, public school with, with 30 students. Totally agree. The challenge is bigger, right? But we cannot forget. Uh, so, so that's why I say if we have this warmth, this empathy and distrust and building positive relationships in this context, sometimes it's easier than uh, changing uh, the whole structure and everything. It, but even so, it is a challenge. So uh, sometimes if you notice that learner, you know, that problem learner that the teacher, the previous teachers already told you, this one is going to cause you trouble. Maybe this could be a good start in, in terms of developing warmth, empathy, and trust. So starting with this learner, because it's def definitely hard. And it's a bigger challenge when you're talking about uh, uh, mainstream schools, especially uh, in the public sector. Right? I, I see this happening, and I, I truly understand. Um, so far, so good with the, with the student-centered teacher. Yes, yes, yes. So far, so good. Yes. All right. So uh, one tip about how to get closer to my students in public school. I stay in class with them during break. That's great, Karina. If you have this opportunity, this helps a lot to actually having this connection with them because then you will have the opportunity to listen to them and they will have the opportunity to see, to notice that you're listening. Because sometimes during the lesson with all these learners and with all this environment, sometimes it can get really hard, right? So that's a great idea, Karina. Um, Professor John Hattie also has another interesting concept that helps with uh, putting learners in the, in the spotlight, right? And that's the concept of invitational learning, right? Uh, so when, uh, have you ever heard of invitational learning? No, no. What do you think that is by the name? Any guesses? With the... No idea. A welcoming approach. Yes. <laughs> let's see. Okay, let's see what he says, right? For him, invitational learner learning is when you invite students to learn, right? What's that? So it's when you have, when you show respect, trust, optimism, and intentionality towards the learning process. So it is really combined with the idea of the teacher-centered uh, teacher, with the student-centered teacher, sorry. Uh, it's really aligned, um, but it has to do with having a commitment and to have a transparent commitment with the learner. So when you show respect towards them, 
so towards their difficulties. Uh, when you show the trust that I've mentioned before, when you're optimistic and optimistic has to do with those, with that thing of believing that they can learn, right? So I think you can learn. Let's think on the bright side. It's hard, it's hard. It's not a matter of ignoring the challenge. The challenge exists, but sometimes uh, ignoring the challenge is not the, the solution. We have to acknowledge that and to say, okay, it's hard, it's difficult, but if you go step by step, let's see where we can get, right? Uh, and intentionality have to do with your expectations and your intention that they will learn. So, okay, it's difficult. Uh, you don't have time to study. You don't have the means. You don't have, you're not able of having contact with the language whatsoever outside this one 50 minute lesson a week but it doesn't mean that you will never learn it means that we will have to go one step at a time so i guess that we can even post challenges let's try to do this by the end of the month let's try to then you show i, I guess you can do it don't 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 let me down show me that you can and then when they can actually showing that and then this will bring, of course, it has to be challenge that it's manageable by that learner. It cannot be greater than their, their ability. Thinking about um, uh, ZPD, for example, the zone of proximal development, you are not going to go beyond what they can. But then we, when you have these milestones, this helps them to, to, to see their learning and to have this and to feel invited to learn. So all of this um, can help you become, get more, uh, get learners more into the center of, of instruction, right? So, um, and something that can also be important that is um, to help students notice that you want them to learn. Tell them that, right? And cherish their conquers. This is important. And sometimes the conquer is something very simple. But if you, you've been learning uh, a foreign language or if you have ever learned French, you will notice that saying the numbers, being able to say 96 can be quite of a challenge. So why not cherish when this happens, right? Um, all right, okay with the invitational learning. Yes, Quatrevan <laughs> says, <laughs> yeah, now. Okay, there is so one more concept that I want to, one more concept I want to, to investigate with you. And that's the, the idea of handing over control to learners. Because um, this sounds beautiful, but if you teach teenagers, children, or in the public sector, or regular schools, you may, this can be frightening. Because uh, we can anticipate 10,000 million things going on, and the, the, the mess happening, right? Um, so this can be uh, more challenging than any than than the other two than being a teacher centered, uh, student centered teacher or uh, having a welcoming uh, lesson to to learning, right? Because uh, when we hand over, we lose control, right? Because the control is at in someone else's hand. And this for us teachers can sometimes be a bit frightening because we know what may happen, right? Uh, yes, <laughs> if you're a control freak, it's even harder, right? Uh, so uh, what does it mean by handing over control to learners, right? Uh, it has to do with a, a student's active involvement 
into their own learning, right? It's focusing on their learning rather than you teaching, right? Uh, it's giving them uh, the opportunity to choose. But for them to make these choices more effectively and without uh, things getting off track, uh, we need to give them good models and to go little by little and to have phases and to have moments for that. Especially if you're thinking about uh, teenagers. If you're thinking about adults, it's probably going to be easier. But if you're talking about teenagers, uh, they don't know what to do with all this freedom, right? So it has to be, they have to be helped in that process. That's why when you say, oh my God, I'm going to give them control, it's going to be a mess. If you simply say, okay, do it, it will. It will be a mess. It can be a healthy and productive, creative mess. It can. But they also need guidance, right? So, um, if you have things uh, like having the target language uh, in the classroom, so for example, this is what I wanted to produce, have that uh, around the classroom, encouraging them to, 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 to take notes as well of the things that they want to use, to actively use that, all this help uh, to get them, uh, to give them more control. So you don't need to say, for example, Okay, we learned this, 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 and that expression today. I want you to use them. Sometimes we can ask them to choose. So which expressions do you want to use, right? So uh, this can help uh, you develop the, the, this, uh, this control, this possibility of having control. So you go little by little, right? And when you uh, something else right so uh, they are going to make a mess if you look at that as okay this is going to be a problem this will be a problem if you just see uh, that as a challenge then we can look and say okay how can i overcome that so if you look and say it's going to be noisy and the teacher from the next the the the, the, the room the next room is going to complain i'm not going to do that uh, then you are losing, you may be losing the opportunity to do something really interesting with them and to actually give them control. But if you look and say, okay, this is, if I do this this way, it's going to be messy. How can I do that in a more organized way, in a way that's going to not going to be so noisy? And then it goes to into your planning. So in your anticipated questions, right? Uh, in your anticipated difficulties when you're planning the lesson. Then it gets easier for you to little by little give them more uh, freedom and involve them more actively in their own learning process. And they feel that and this usually is quite motivating and engaging for them, thus improving uh, learning results, right? Uh, and making the whole process more enjoyable for everyone because um, everybody should enjoy the lesson, right? Not only the learners, but also the teachers. So this has to be done together, right? And it's already 5.50, so I, I wanted to open for questions, right? So, or for comments. So how would you uh do this any suggestions karina have been doing some suggestions here as well right uh actually take time to teach them how to take notes this is really really important we cannot take it for granted that things that students already know how to do these things right sometimes they don't uh give options how they feel they have control over the class exactly um bruno what if what if part of the learning takes place outside the class in a virtual environment for example that would reduce the amount of noise and mess in the class this is a possible solution for example if you have the means 
right? So we can have a Padlet, for example, and then they could contribute to the Padlet um, outside uh, the classroom. And then inside, you just work with, with that information. You have different ways of doing that. That's a nice idea. Karina, I take time to teach them study uh, extra out of class two. This is also really interesting. Study skills, if you're thinking about teenagers, is essential. They are, they don't, sometimes they don't have that in uh, Portuguese. So they don't have that in English. Some adults also don't. So these studying uh, techniques and this learning how to study is really important. And you're giving them control because then they can try. And they can try different techniques and choose the one that they prefer. So you can say, okay, try studying every day, uh, 30 minutes every day. Okay, try studying twice uh, uh, a week, but for a long, longer period. Okay, which one works best for you? Then they can choose. Right? Um, let me see here. Complain. Just check. So give them options. Da, da, da. Students may complain you're not teaching English, but then we can communicate that, that this is going to help them learn English, that it's part of their learning process. But I, I, I can see that happening. They say, but it's not English. But you can do that, depending on their level, you can do that in English as well, and then work on that meta language as well, in that case. Uh, <laughs> um, and what if the class only waits for the teacher to do everything, when, even if you motivate them to participate more? Yes, this can happen, Carolyn. So um, I have already seen that happening in my classes. And then I got some help from a fellow teacher. And what we did was to understand why they didn't want to participate, right? And some students were really shy. Uh, other students have this. Uh, and then I noticed that the problem was really the relationship. Then I started working on this positive relationship with them. And little by little, they started contributing. Sometimes it has to be little by little. And what helped me in that case was working on the positive relationship. It helped a lot. Someone mentioned before the effective learning. It helps. It definitely helps. Um, on the following class, would you only show... Yes, coming back to Bruno's suggestion of doing things outside the class and then bringing, maybe not only showing, but sharing, I'd say, because then the, with the sharing, you have the interaction as well going on. They can look at each other's work. They can, you can guide some feedback as well. So you can guide peer feedback on what they have produced, telling, okay, I like art because of this, this, and that, starting with positive feedback, these kind of things. So it's really interesting as well. And when you work with peer feedback, they, you're also handing control to learners. But just telling learners, uh, give feedback to your, to your classmate, it's not going to be effective many times. So we have to guide, maybe having some questions for them to, to follow and so on. Right? Uh, I'm thinking about making a video about it. So I send it to them every every year about learning how to study by themselves. This can be an idea, but I wouldn't miss the opportunity of talking to them about that because different groups may have uh, different um, preferences in that sense. But having these videos always help, right? because then you focus on the differences later on in class. Uh, I like to teach them how to study, learn, and encourage them to learn on their own so they understand that they 
are the protagonists of their learning outside the classroom too. That's a good idea too, Lucia. This helps a lot. Um, okay, teaching online. I guess lots of people started uh, starting to teach online uh, nowadays. Sometimes because it was the plan. Sometimes because the circumstances push a little bit into that direction, right? Um, when you're teaching online, I'd say it's much easier to lose this uh, student-centeredness. So uh, we have to be very careful about that. So in really invite learners to contribute, open their mics for them to contribute. It will depend a lot on the kind of platform you're using. If you're talking about Zoom, for example, you have breakout rooms, so you can have groups and you can visit the groups. So uh, it would help. Uh, but even if it's something simple, you have just uh, the video and the chat, get them to participate and as much as possible and try to get different learners to participate. Not all of them may be in the same lesson. Depends on, it depends on how many learners you have. Uh, but tell them that you want everybody to contribute. Ask them to contribute via chat as well. They'll be developing uh, their writing skills by doing that as well. So this is uh, an idea, right? But this is a learning moment for everyone. And when it comes to teaching online, just like teaching face-to-face, -face, you have to... Different people will have different strategies. And uh, sometimes a strategy that works for one doesn't work for the other. It depends on how tech savvy you are. You can go little by little for yourself as well. But involve learners in that. Tell them. So I'm learning this as well. So did it work for you? How do you think, do you prefer to, to contribute talking on the mic or chatting? What do you think that? And so on. Involve them in the decisions of planning, especially if it was something that happened because of the pandemic circumstances, right? Um, I'm certain I suggest 30 minutes a day. Yeah, depending on how you guide, you are, you are also giving students the protagonism. You're just guiding, you're not saying, follow this. You're just saying you have this way to follow. Right? Um, standard, you know. Okay. Songs, suggest something. If this has free online open courses, the, 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 their open courses are really interesting, I'd say, to give it a try. Just, um, all right. Okay, so already lots of ideas going on. I guess you're already fully in charge, in control of this exchange of ideas, right? And I just want to share with you some suggested literature on the matter, right? And I love that you're exchanging context. That's wonderful. That's uh, what keeps us uh, improving all the time, right? So some uh, reference for you. The first one is a podcast. The second one is John Hattie's book. And uh, those concepts I've mentioned came from, the, from that book, right? So take a look if you, if you want more details, right? And let me just share my email with you. Uh, it's in the chat box, right? Leticia at troikabr.com. And please follow us at Troika in the, our Instagram, our Instagram and Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. And we have now uh, an area for members as well. We have lots of webinars for them there as well. And we try to keep this information going and flowing there, right? So thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. And 
I hope to hear from you. See you virtually or in face-to-face -face all the time. Thank you very much. And bye-bye.